people, um, or it might just be that they don't like the healthier diet. They actually prefer the less healthy food, the less healthy diet, for any number of reasons. And I think part of them probably are palate. So when we think about the government diet, or the government plate, or the government market plate, I think it's worth thinking about the government palate. That is the palate that we have created in young people as a consequence of the food policies that we have that produce certain kinds of food, expose young kids to those foods rather than others. So let's, Zeke, let me turn to young people yeah. and talk about school lunches. <laughs> because those are, um, that's an opportunity when children, and I've got three of them, yeah. make choices. Um, and they may make it on the basis of imperfect information, but also the food that's available to them in school lunches may not be particularly nutritious. So is there a problem with the nutritional value of school lunches, and how does that come about, and how do we fix it? So under the Obama administration, and um, I'm no longer shilling for them, but... Um, I'm no longer shilling for them, but... But I think overall, the thing to, to note is that it's just a remarkable captive audience. If we're talking about obesity yeah. in kids, it's an amazing captive audience. It's like, oh, out in the world, you can't control it, you can't control it. Yeah, they're there eight hours a day, six hours a day, they're eating there, and I think last, that's about 30 million meals, yeah. 30 million kids each day that are fed. So that's a massive portion of the U.S. population that we just get to decide what they eat. We just get to decide what they eat, and we could decide they should eat a little bit less if it's caloric, we could decide they should only eat vegetables if we wanted that, or any number of different things, but that's a really, really big tool that the federal government has. Talked about what the things we are talking about. We haven't talked about GMOs yet. You know, for example, genetic, genetically modified organisms. FDA has not made a distinction between GMOs and non-GMOs. Is, is that something we should be talking about? Is it something we need to study further? Where are we uh, with respect to that particular issue? Yeah, so I mean, I think to say we're not talking about it isn't quite right. I think that there are a lot of voices out there who are talking about it and who are very, very concerned about it. So there is a, a Vermont passed first GMO labeling law in the country. Uh, there's litigation over whether it's constitutional, will be upheld, but there is an initiative there. It will be upheld. Uh, We're betting on that. He's very good at betting on that. A similar initiative failed in California a few years ago, but it wouldn't be surprising if it's back on the ballot there or something came out of Oregon. So I think those questions are very much being asked. Uh, there is a big push at the federal level of both to pass legislation to preempt all those laws and stop any states from requiring. GMO labeling, um, and also to require it. There's a, a fairly big, fairly vocal push, and the social media efforts, I think, really, really extensive. Now, should the FDA be, FDA be doing anything, studying it? Definitely. Should, are we there yet, and um, what do we know? It's, it's a little bit less clear. Mm -hmm. So my reading of the literature uh, and the studies is that I'm not aware of any study, though I, I would like to see one if there is, that shows that there's a, a concrete physical health effect or harm from consuming GMO products. Mm -hmm. There is um, totally sensible literature suggesting that what has happened with some of the GMO products produces or will produce environmental harms. That could be scary. And so if you think about, for example, uh, Monsanto's Roundup Ready product. What this is, to be clear, is um, it's a genetically modified seed that you plant that's resistant to uh, Monsanto's uh, Roundup herbicide. And that means you can put as much of that on there as you want, and the plant is going to be fine, and all the other weeds are going to go down. And that makes farming very, very efficient. Yields are supposed to go up, and all is fine and good. Unless using a lot of Roundup is really bad for the environment, or for anyone who consumes that. Um, and the concern is that over a couple of years, rather than a couple of hundred years, the weeds that survive that Roundup are going to be really, really strong and resistant weeds, kind of super weeds. And so we'll have to ratchet up the next batch of Roundup resistant and Roundup. And that process of kind of ratcheting up uh, is a concern environmentally. And I don't think we're sure it hurts environmentally. We're not sure it produces horrible evolutionary effects. But people are anxious about it. And so if I ask my students, you like this stuff? They no, 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 no. And if I ask them why, they have no idea. And I think that's a very common reaction, actually. There's fear and concern, but we can't quite articulate exactly why, exactly what. So I don't think the science is there, but we're surely going to study this and talk about it a lot more. So, so I, 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 would, I would, first, I think the, I would agree with what you said. The, the, the main, certainly on the health finding, there is no study 
Uh, and again, if someone knows of a study, I'd, I'd love to hear about it. But there's no say that they showed any problem, and there's no reason to really think there should be any problem health-wise from a GMO. Um, and I think we need to be just upfront and honest about that. Um, the environmental factors, a little more unknown. Um, I would say, second, it has always perplexed me that you know, we've got to give the consumers all the information and let them choose, and this is one area where the producers don't want to give them the information and don't want them to make choices and have really tried to obstruct providing this basic information on the idea, exactly as Jacob said, that most of us feel queasy about it, um, and we probably avoid it if we could. You know, if something said GMO, something said non-GMO, and we were sure that we got the right information, we would probably make a choice on that basis, even though it may make no health difference to us because who knows why. Um, uh, I've always found this idea that they object suddenly to releasing that information on First Amendment grounds was like, well, or whatever grounds they're, they're like, kind of crazy. I mean, all the other time you want us to don't regulate it, just give the consumer the information. The last thing, point I would make is I actually do think in this case, personally, the American public is a little more, ra a lot more rational than the European public. The European public, the GMOs are like, you would think they were the black plague with the way the <laughs> Europeans talk about it. I'm not joking. And the, they are much more uh, into excluding GMOs, etc. Now, I ought to tell you, that has knock-on effects, which most people don't appreciate, in the developing world, which is if they have GMO seeds, they can't sell to Europe. And it uh, any of their products, and it creates a real problem because the Europeans are very, very uh, uh, stringent about any contamination, etc. So it has a big impact on farmers in Africa, which you wouldn't think about in terms of restricting their access to markets uh, in Europe. And I think they, I think the Europeans have gone overboard. My own personal view, given the data we have on the health, gone overboard on this issue, and I think we are a little more um, uh, sober about it. Um, For example, by the UN, among others, that factory farms produce uh, in the way in which they go about producing food actually is harmful to the environment. Um, it, would you ag agree with that? And then secondly, to what extent should that also become part of the conversation with regard to food regulation? Yeah, yeah I absolutely agree with that. And I'm, I think I'm on record somewhere as saying food is the biggest environmental issue there will be in the next 15 years, 20 years. That's where I heard it, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, there's just no question that the consequences of the farming practices and ranching practices um, and food production and distribution, all of those consequences are massive environmentally. Um, and farming is a very quirky uh, area in U.S. environmental regulation. We regulate some stuff, we don't regulate other stuff, um, and it is, I think, the next frontier of U.S. environmental law, and rightly so. Mm -hmm. Actually, in that regard, I think, so one of the things we haven't also spoken about is the whole use in meat production of antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And the worry that the antibiotics, you know, you give to the cows or the chickens ends up in the water supply, uh, in the meat itself, and we are all uh, uh, the recipients. And it's not just antibiotics, it's, you know, hormones and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. um, and again, part of the problem is there's some, the data aren't overwhelmingly great, but other countries have restricted use, uh, eliminated, I mean, in Denmark, use of antibiotics in food and meat uh, production. Um, again, I think this is one of those big issues. And here, I think, actually, interestingly enough, consumers have driven a lot of change. So I think it was Purdue, right, that just said they're getting rid of the antibiotics uh, just used for growth uh, in their chickens. Um, and you see a lot of uh, companies now, Chipotle and others, talking about mm -hmm. how their foods, you know, no antibiotic production, no um, uh, GMOs, etc., that I think that is going to drive a much bigger segment of the food industry to try to do, uh, respond to uh, what consumers want or think they want. And I think that's actually, you know, finally we're now having a pretty positive impact because Again, the connection between your diet, uh, your health, and avoiding disease, I think, has gotten much, much stronger in most people. And they can see that, you know, even if they don't cook well for themselves, they can see at least demanding of their restaurants that they do a better job. Can I just follow up on that? Sure, briefly? excellent. I'd first, just to plug, we'll have a conference on Friday at Harvard Law School on antibiotics and food, and it'll be streamed. So anyone who wants more information about that should watch us. It'll be a great conference. 
Um, second, I think the, op the operative word in what he said is finally. You know, finally we <laughs> are accomplishing. Finally we are achieving. That's been a very, very long process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The FDA started talking about this issue in the late 1970s. There was quite a lot of information that there was some cause for concern, disagreement about the studies, as there always is. They started a process to stop the use of antibiotics for growth. That got halted over a period of decades by the political process. Um, what's happened now is the FDA has issued a voluntary guideline asking the industry to figure out how to reduce the use of antibiotics. Um, and industry has responded. And I think part of that has really been driven by the public, as we say, and consumers. It has also been driven by the industry itself. And I think all that is to the good. But it's been a very, very long process to get there. And it's not clear whether to think about that as a great success or a failure. Mm -hmm. And with any of these issues, there are transition problems. So what people who I talk to in the restaurant food industry say is like, we go to our producers and we say, we want to do this. Can you do it? And they say, yeah, in five years. We can get there, but not immediately. And so I think this question of transition and what gets fudged during the transition, whether it's no antibiotics for growth, no antibiotics for anything less than a thera therapeutic purposes, none at all, is it going to be a lot of the detail and important in the next couple of years? Thanks. Yeah.